Start streaming over on Twitch as well. Collections, sprites, and prefabs is what we're talking about today. Alright. Oh. Oh, this is going to be tricky. Twitch is not going to let me stream this unless I exit Discord and come back in again. I forgot about that. I'm setting up everything. Um, I'm going to recommend everybody watch this in YouTube then. That's what I'll, uh, or uh, I'll be right back. Okay, I'm just gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop out of Discord and then pop right back in again just so I can get the streaming happening. So I'll be right back. Let everybody know if anyone comes in. <laughs> okay, sorry about this. Okay. Is everybody still hearing me? In the sky to you. So can I be heard and the music, hopefully? Sometimes the music? Alright. <laughs> I don't know if anyone is typing anything, but so... Can, can someone say something or let me know that's... <laughs> yeah, the the, uh, the audio, the music and the desktop audio will kind of cut in and out, um, just kind of the way that Discord is designed. So um, we'll have to... I'll just use that for, for kind of demonstration purposes, so I'll, I'll turn that down a bit anyway. So, um, okay, how's everybody doing? Um, let's see, we only have two, four, six, six or so. So I guess a lot of people I'm going to assume are taking advantage of the sort of time, um, time shifting of our class here and not, and, and watching kind of offline or watching via the other, uh, Twitch and YouTube. For some reason, LMS and the uploaded videos on there are giving me a problem. I'm not sure if that's uh, some kind of limitation on the amount of video I can upload or if there's just a glitch. We're trying to get it worked out uh, with LMS uh, folks at this point. As you can imagine, there's not a lot of people around on campus <laughs> helping with everything and anything. So uh, we'll, we'll get to the bottom of that. But in the meantime, if you can catch the videos on either um, YouTube or on Twitch, that's the most turning out to be the most reliable way to do it. Uh, I am recording everything, so eventually, hopefully, we'll catch up on LMS and everything will be there as well. So, all right. Uh, so, housekeeping first. This Wednesday at midnight, so Wednesday midnight, meaning Thursday a.m. or Thursday uh, first thing, uh, that's when the, the first project is due. Right, so the goal is to have everything done. Um, normally what I ask is that the um, that what you do is there will be a submission point on LMS. So to, to basically say I am submitting the project on LMS usually and as we get into the more elaborate projects there will be a point there so you're going to like put a, a short sort of design document for your game. Uh, as your games get more elaborate than the, than this one. But we'll put some sort of submission point there so you can just put a short description, uh, ultimately saying my project did this, I demonstrated that, and, and so on and so forth. It gives me a place basically to post your grades because that's one thing that the um, 
Unity Teams doesn't allow me to do. There is no team. There is no uh, grading system built into Unity Teams, so we do rely on LMS for that. So you don't have to submit your whole project on LMS. Uh, one of the reasons to try to get all this squared away, all this stuff with Unity Teams as early as possible, so that we can not worry about that piece of it. But I will ask that you do some sort of submission. Now it may very well be my project was completed on time because that's it's it's. Uh, Basically what it means is because with Unity Teams you can be submitting and updating and basically you know continuously working on your project, there's no way for me to say, okay, at exactly what point is it done? Is it handed in? Is it early? Is it late? Right? Mostly this comes into play when a project is, is late. So um, the idea is that you submit a project or you submit the, the uh, your you make your submission on LMS to say to me, yes, please grade my project. And that's the, the that's when the, the clock starts ticking when I consider okay, you know. So if you submit something and at midnight on time, that means okay, I will look at that version and consider that to be, you know, the version that I'm checking. Right. So so I need more or less two things to sort of line up. You can submit anytime, you can you can upload anytime you want on, on the Unity Teams, but then sometime before midnight, uh, I consider that to be when the project is, you know, you have to submit something. So in other words, if you don't have your project ready, there's no sense in submitting something on LMS because then I will look at that and then not see the corresponding stuff inside of Unity Teams. So if you do need extra time and you do want to submit something late, we're going to go by where it is uh, with regards to uh, the LMS submission. It sounds more complicated than it actually is. So basically what I want you to do is, you know, work on everything, do it in Unity Teams. And then once you're ready for me to take a look at it, it's the, basically the triggering point where I'm going to, you know, try to line things up saying, okay, at the, as of this point, please look at my project. So, you know, consider that to be the version for grading. Okay. Um, if you would like, uh, I, uh, I I will allow some, you know, I do allow for late submissions, uh, as it says in the uh, in the syllabus, in terms of at a, you know with a, with a grade penalty. Um, but if you do submit something, you can kind of get it in. That's not quite finished. Sometimes that's better than handing something in late that is more finished. So uh, if you do want to submit something and then make a late submission to make up, you know, to kind of fill in some things, that's okay. Uh, just you need to then make a late submission on LMS as well. So I know that, okay, there's another new version because um, there is no, like I said, there's no notification system in Unity Teams. So I use, I rely on the LMS kind of notification and, and milestone kind of benchmarking for, you know, the considering when things are, are due. Sounds complicated, hopefully isn't all that complicated. All right. Um, yeah, don't put your whole projects up there because it will definitely clog up LMS. LMS isn't great at like managing Unity projects. All right. Uh, there's still a couple of people. I think we're finally working out all the details on some of the little bits and pieces with regards to the, um, uh, let's see, the Unity Team stuff. So we're almost there. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, if you haven't, or if you have any issues, there there are uh, a lot of resources with regards to Unity Teams. If you do a, a Google search on that, or you can reach out to me, and we can work together on uh, uh, on the uh, direct messaging. That you know, Unity has some things that kind of will also help kind of lead you through. You do have to, you know, is a kind of a multi part thing. Usually, there's a Unity organization that you set up. And then there's, you know, inviting me to a team. And there's also this notion of you have to have the uh, the team service, the, you know, kind of uh, subscription service enabled for me in particular and you so that we can collaborate on things. We're, we're 90 plus percent of the way there. So we're, we're doing all right. Um, I will have more office hours. So office hours, I kind of consider by appointment these days because it works out for everybody. Uh, that way, so just kind of let me know. We can kind of set up a time. Otherwise, we can set up a time. You know, usually during the day, afternoons are really good. Mornings are even better because you know, for me, I don't uh, you know I like to do yard work in the afternoon if I can. But um, I will be around, especially because of the project. I'll be around a lot tomorrow for office hours and a lot on Wednesday uh, during the day for office hours as well. 
So consider it, you know, contact me if I'm not available immediately at that time, we'll set up another time to do it. All right, so we'll get through it. So to refresh the project kind of, uh, let me go over now, let's go to the scene. Let's just talk a little bit about the project and what I'm expecting. Um, hopefully I have the right version of this uh, open now. So the idea behind the actual adventure game piece of it is that there's going to be a simple scene, right? And let's see which scene is this. I'm looking at the adventure scene here. All right. So in the adventure scene, there should be a canvas, right? On that canvas are your main buttons that you're going to interact with. North, south, west, east, could be up, down, left, right. Think of it that way, but it's you know, basically a D-pad, a directional pad. So you've got a, a number of buttons that the user will then interact with to uh, they'll, you know, push to move the, a character through the world, move the player through the world. There should also be some sort of either action or you know, managed resource kind of button or toggle as well. Right, this flashlight and the flashlight battery is the one I used in my example. Um, there are definitely YouTube videos up that go through all of kind of each of these kind of things in terms of you know ca connecting things to buttons. How I you know some examples of using the flashlight and batteries and resources and so on. So some of these are going to be you know I'm going to show you all the techniques and then hopefully you know you can kind of knit them together into something that looks sort of like this. It should be pretty straightforward. Don't get very carried away with this project. All right, so there's a canvas that has these main user interface elements on it. I want them to be the buttons. I want actions attached to buttons, like the on click and uh, on value changed, right? We're not using the normal input system yet. We're not using the keyboard or the mouse or joysticks or anything like that. We're using the UI system for now. So I, I need to see you demonstrate that you understand how the UI system works, that you've watched those videos, okay? Then, and this part is even, it's sort of optional, right? If we go to the camera of the scene, now there's certain objects that are placed here uh, on the, the, in the camera view, right? There's some objects, there's a player, which I just used a little sprite on here just to indicate. And then I have this ocean game object, which is just a sound, just an audio source basically. Uh, and there's a key which doesn't even have anything on it. It just has a position. So really, those are the sort of the main things. There's there's a player, and it really exists mostly for the purposes of having a transform on it, so somewhere to store a position. And uh, there is also a place to put the script on. So we have the player controller script and the transform. We may have some sound sources, audio sources on there as well. It's an easy place to contain them. So we're really just using the player to contain those components. All right. And then the ocean, like I said, it's just a transform with an audio source. And the key is just an object that has a transform. All right. So you can think of them as really being sort of data structures that are here in the game. So I know data structures can be a, hopefully known as traumatized by me saying that, but it's sort of it's sort of like that, right? So those are the things that are in the scene, and the way the gameplay goes is that uh, if we go and we start the, the gameplay, it's pretty straightforward. The player, and you, we can see the player here because we have the sprites in the scene, right? And you can move the player around. Now, even if this battery is not turned on, even though I can't see the player, if you see up here in my text window, in my console window, I'm, I'm printing out the position. So I'm keeping track of that. And if I look up here also, if I click on player, you'll see position changing. Do -do -do! And I hit the wall. And if I move left and right, you see X and Y changing, really. So this is this is just really for the purposes of containing that transform, from containing that X and Y value, All right? And as it moves around, I have in my script now, I have this player controller script, which is the thing that is controlling things, and that is handling that motion through this, through a movement function, and then also it has some simple logic to say, ah, okay, if I've hit a wall, 
right? If I've changed the position beyond some value, that means I've, I'm bumping into the wall, right? I've moved x beyond an allowable value, right? Or I've moved y beyond an allowable value. I would then play my audio source, which would be hitting the wall, and my I also change the text component to say you hit the wall, right? So as we saw here, when I hit that wall, go to the south. Do do do. Uh, well, I guess I do. Yep, I overwrote that with that. <laughs> do. So I change some code here. Let's go back. Player, player controller. Um, I also had my warmer, colder kind of aspect here. That should have just added. Found the key. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Go to the canvas. Make sure I have enough room for the. Hmm. That should fit. So let's get for debugging as I go here. Let's see. Do do. In a quiet place, I feel colder. So something must not be happening right in my code. So I'll go to my script. And I see, OK, this is being printed out. I can see that happening. And that happens after I hit the wall. Right? So that's the problem. So if I, I can always just kind of look through my code to see you know, what's on the screen, compare that to what's in the code. That's one of the big differences of uh, interactive programming versus kind of the typical computer science project where you just say, you know, give it value in, give it value out, and you hope for the best. Um, here we hopefully are kind of seeing it um, as it happens. So my code here where I said I hit a wall, that gets set, but then later on down here, I overwrote that there. All right, well, I don't want to debug this in terms of the lecture here. <laughs> I'll come back and do that in a either in another video or we can kind of get into that. All right, so the idea is that you have this text that's being updated based on the position as you move around, and there's also some audio that will be manipulated as you move around. Um, the flashlight will allow you to have some sort of condition or state that you're managing on or off, and then the game will behave slightly differently depending on whether or not that flat, that action happens and, and so on. This, the videos for that. Hopefully uh, people have seen those as well. Uh, there is a score that is shown. So we're keeping track of some sort of score. Normally now we're just using a real simple, you know, every time the player moves, one gets added to the score. Or if the player is moving while the flashlight's on, maybe two gets added to the score. So it's really, it's not a, you know, in this case, higher numbers are bad, lower numbers are good. So it's maybe a number of moves, that sort of thing. And then the idea is that after the player moves around, sort of the, what, what's happening is that the player has to collect or go near this key object down here. So the player's movement will, at some point, the location will match this key. And once it does, we say, OK, now we can go over to this other object. And because we're holding that key, we can win the game, right? That's the sort of thing that's happening, right? So we say, move the object and then check, did we hit or is the location of that object the same as the target? If so, then we can set some state and then we can move around and so on. So we do this first, then that, right? Any questions on on that? Hopefully, I'm trying to summarize it now all in, in under 10 minutes suddenly, it was more complicated than the other, all the other lectures that I went through going about it. But, um, okay. So any questions, I'll set up office hours. Let me get back to the actual lecture notes. That would probably be a better thing for today, though. So let me just uh, content and pull up lecture notes. And you'll see on LMS, I've actually, I posted this last week. I put um, both of this week's lectures are already up there. 
collections, lists and arrays, sprites and prefabs is already up there, as well as vectors and physics. So those are some of the main things that you're going to need to, to kind of uh, move past this first project and into the second project. And we'll discuss the second project a little bit uh, shortly, depending on how far we get in this piece of things. And ah, OK, this is the I'm not used to posting the PDF version. All right, so here is the PDF version. All right, so collections, sprites, and prefabs. Hopefully, also, uh, you may have noticed up on, again, on Twitch and YouTube, there were some other videos. There's one specifically that was sort of the hint or the early teaser to this that talked a little bit about using arrays and structures as part of the project if you wanted to, to go there. You didn't need to use arrays or structures as part of the first project, but they fall into a little bit of this uh, category of collections. Okay, so you can go back after this, you can go back and che check out that video. That would be great. All right, so collections. What are collections? So in C Sharp, a collection is a group of things that are referenced by a single variable. You can think of those being sort of a larger bucket that can contain multiple things of the same type, right? So it might be a collection of enemies. It might be a collection of obstacles. It might be a collection of wheels. It could be a collection of anything. Uh, it's, imagine you have a, you know, a by example, uh, a pride of lions or a colony of ants or a murder of crows, as they say, right? This is a thing where you have some sort of collection, some sort of grouping of like objects into a group that we can then just refer to. Now, two of the most commonly used and most important C-sharp collections that, especially with regards to Unity, are lists and arrays. There are other ones, there are other kinds, uh, certainly in C-sharp, and you can even create your own collections and so on, but those tend to be the two most important ones with regards to Unity because most of the Unity uh, functionality and the Unity objects kind of uh, fall into those categories. Unity likes to use uh, lists and arrays. Sp particularly, it likes to use arrays, right? Now, uh, the one of the cool things about them, they, that level of integration goes down to the point of being able to appear in the inspector. So you can look at these arrays and lists in the inspector. Uh, that's also something that demonstrated in, in the last video, uh, the bonus video as well. Typically, uh, when you're programming and you will need to manage a bunch of things, you, you want to manage the number of objects on the screen or the number of things that you're creating, lists tend to be more flexible than arrays. So they're going to have a lot in common. They both are means of, of kind of holding these collections, but they each have some advantages and disadvantages and some... Uh, you know, uh, different situations you might want to use one or the other. So I like to talk about lists first because they tend to be more flexible and you can almost always use a list where you might use an array where it's sometimes it's more difficult to use an array where you would use a list. So, all right. So a list, conceptually, hopefully you get the idea of what a list is, you know, it's the uh, first thing you do is you, you have, say, maybe it's a piece of paper, and on that piece of paper, then you write things down. That's the typical thing we think of when we think of a list. But a list of what? You know, it's a list of words, a list of ideas, a list of something. So in C-sharp and a lot of typed languages, lists require types, right? Things that are on uh, a list need to be of similar type, right? So the question then is, do you need a data structure specifically for a group of strings, a group of floats, a group of custom classes, and so on. And in the case of lists, the nice thing is that you don't have to deal with this potentially awful situation where you have a separate sort of data structure for keeping track of every type of collection. Instead, you can use lists. Lists are generic collections, right? And what a generic collection is, it basically means it will work for any type of data, any data type, right? You can like in this slide here, or in this uh, next uh, thing here, we say, okay, if I want a list of strings, here's where our our uh, generic brackets kind of come into play. We say, here's a list of strings, and we'll just call it a string list. So this is how we will declare a list of strings, All right? And you could also have things like a list of game objects, and we'll call it a go list, a G game object list. That's a list of game objects. 
So that is how we declare a string, excuse me, declare a list. Now working with lists it typically is a two-part process, right? First you declare the list and then you initialize the list. Okay, so you declare what a list is going to contain and then you sort of have to really kind of kick it off by creating a new list, right? And this is what we're doing in this section here. So to create a, uh, a string list, we're going to first declare the name of it, and then we're going to actually go ahead and assign a list of strings to that declared string list, right? So this is the two-part process there. So far, so good. Let's see. Uh, let see if I can pop over here it's really tough to get like a show of hands or anything like that over here <laughs> but um, every so often I'll just uh, type all right stop me at any point um, it is tricky I, I normally raised hands and things and, and befuddled looks on people's faces are easy to see in person um, so I'm gonna kind of count on you folks, uh, either you know, if you want to ask afterwards, that's good too. But chances are, if you have a question, other people might have the same question. All right. So these are going to get easier to use also as we get into sort of the examples of them as well. All right. So you create a list. So we'll have the structure we'll call str list, and then we want to add things to that list. All right. So we have a simple add method that is part of that class that uh, list right so to this string list that I created here I might want to add some strings so I can add the string that is hello and add the string that is world so now this string list will contain hello and world now I've never actually tried to do this and we'll make it interesting um, let's see there was that uh, uh, interactive C sharp. Where'd that go? Here we go. Let's give this a try. For those. All right. So we're going to go to this focus mode here. Hopefully you can see this. And here's a .NET editor. And I'm going to try to go ahead and make this uh, do what I just said. So why don't we try that? All right. So we'll come over here. And we're going to create this program, and we're going to declare a list of strings. And if you like, you can certainly follow this along. So a list of strings called string list. Okay. Now we have a valid piece of code so far. And then we say str list equals new. And we have to tell it what it is new. It's a new list of strings. All right. It is not a list. It is a list. So let's fix my typo here. All right. So far, so good. And then we will say string list now dot add hello. All right. So if I run this code, not a heck of a lot happens because there is no output. I really can't see anything as a result of that. All right. So I've really just created this list and I've put an item into that list. Nothing past that. So now let's go a little further. Let's try to reference the elements of that list. All right. And just so I have more than one element, I'm going to go ahead and cut and paste here. And hello world. And I'll even do this. Hello unity. Oops. And we'll say GSAS 2540. Okay. And if we say run, we still don't see an awful lot of anything. All right. But remember, okay, we've declared the list, we've initialized the list, initialized the list, and now we're adding elements to the list. So now we're going to want to reference, you know, we're going to do something useful to that list or to the elements of that list. So to, to access an element of a list, we use square brackets. 
So for example, in this case, imagine we want to access the zeroth. Now everything is zero reference. That means the first thing in the list. And here I'm going to have to say console right line. Okay, the one difference between our example code over here that we'd run in Unity and what we're doing here in this is we have to use console right line instead of print. So now if I run this program, you'll see I got hello down here, right? Can everyone see that? Is this coming through? Oops. All right. Hopefully, no reactions. <laughs> OK. All right, so um, I can reference the zeroth, or the first thing I put onto the list I access by saying string list 0. So if instead I said string, li string list 2, example, and I hit run, I see unity, because that is the, ultimately, it's the third thing that I added to the list, but it's 0, 1, 2. OK, so you saw, see the thing I added there. All right. So now I have that collection, that list made, that has those four elements in the list. And I can reference to each one of them by using the name of the list and the element number. Right? So uh, it's also useful, quite often, to know how many things are in the list. So that's where we come into this next bit. We say console right line. And now we're going to say str list dot count. And that will tell us, if we run, it'll tell us, OK, how many things are in that list? And notice this is 4. It is 0, 1, 2, 3, if we wanted to reference them. But there are four elements in the list, four items, four elements there in the list. OK, so this is very useful for saying, you know, okay, imagine I wanted to keep track of something like, you know, every time an enemy spawned, or any time the enemy shot a bullet, or the enemy dropped an apple, or whatever, uh, I want to put it into a list so I can keep track of it. And then I'm going to figure out, okay, how many of those are on the screen or in the world, right? That's where I would use these. Very easy to do. Now, in managing that list, I can also do things like destroy the list or clear the list. I should say, yeah, clearing is different than destroying. Clearing a list is just getting rid of all the elements. It doesn't destroy the list. It just gets rid of all the elements. So imagine after this, create some sample here where now it printed out, you know, unity, which was the, uh, which was on the list. That was the second, not the zeroth, zeroth first, second element there. And then we said, okay, how many were in the list, there were four. But then I cleared the list, and then now the list has zero. Okay, so it's empty again. So that's the most basic pieces of a, of a list, right? That you have create a list, then you add items to a list, and you can clear the list. But now you can imagine you're going to want to do something a little bit more elaborate than that. Okay, so over here we have our list of <laughs> our list of methods, our list of list methods. So obviously we could reference the elements there. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to say, uh, well, I'll let you uh, refer back to this slide if you want to see these. But we'll, we'll try them over here with our list over here, right? A little bit different. So things like adding. We've already added items to the list. Did that over here. We can say clear. So we clear the list that removed all the items from the list. Now we get into the more interesting parts. Whoops. Sorry. That's probably a prank phone call. Yeah. Anyway. I don't know if you've heard that. My phone just started ringing. So, OK. Now, one other interesting thing we can do is we can reinitialize a list. All right, let's run that one. So what's happened here, say I didn't want to actually add. I didn't want to go through and add these things all one by one. 
I can populate a list in a single go, like this. All right, so here I said, okay, get rid of the string list that was there, and now replace it with this new list that has these strings in it. So I could have said unity, hello, gsas, and so on. And I would still have four. They'd still be there. And then I could do things like, let's see what's in that list. Take a look. Sure enough, there's gsas, which is the 0, 1, 2 element. Okay. So we can reinitialize the list. We can also look up things in the list. Right. This is where it gets particularly useful. So what we do is we can say, ah, OK, tell me where in the list is a certain element. So for example, here it's trying to say, OK, where is B in the list? And that would return 1, because B in this list is 0, 1. Right? So there's 1 there. Um, Where's Bob in the list? Well, that's Bob isn't in that list, so it's going to return negative 1. Right? So in our case, if we said console, oops, uh, right line, you should always have one of those handy, and say str list dot index of, and we'll say unity. Got that right. And you'll see unity is the zeroth element of that list. All right. So that's giving us the index of that element. Then if we're not satisfied with the simple add, so just adding, what adding is always doing, adding is always adding things, elements to the end of the list, right? So you see how we went hello world unity gsas2540. They're entered in that exact order. So instead, if say we want to put something in the list at a particular location, we can tell it exactly what in what uh, location to put it at. So what it'll do is it'll put it at that location and sort of push all the rest beyond that, right? So imagine I did this. I would say uh, string list insert. Uh, and I'm going to insert it at 0. OK. And I'm going to type first. So I want to put that at the head of the list here. And now watch this. If I run this, we'll see the first console right line here said, ah, the index of unity was 0. Then I inserted something at 0. And then I asked, OK, what is the index of unity again? And now that's 1. Because it's pushed unity, or it's inserted first into the list before unity. Right? So now if I went back and said, String list zero. All right, I'll put it in both spots here. I'll do it uh, there and there. So even though I'm saying string list zero, it's going to change from unity to first. All right. Similarly, we can remove elements of a list. We can say, okay, I <coughs> excuse me. Remove C, remove unity, remove whichever. So we want to, if we want to remove a list because an enemy is killed or a bullet runs out of time or a something falls off the world or off the bounds or at the edge of the screen, that sort of thing. Okay. So this becomes really, really handy to be able to like add things to the collection, remove things from the collection, manage a collection like that. Okay. So that hands us uh, brings us through most things. Now I'm gonna. This is kind of a catch-22 uh, in that we can also, if we need to, we can actually convert from lists to arrays. So we can convert back and forth 
between lists and arrays. And I'll talk about why I'd want to do that in a minute, but uh, just we'll kind of keep that in mind, right? So if I wanted to do that, I could. And I'll just I'll go ahead and bring this. I'm liking doing this uh, interactive coding here. This is kind of kind of fun here. So if I run, everything's ready. Now it's in a a string array instead of a string list down here. Okay. So arrays. Okay. How are they different? Arrays, they're also collections. Structurally or under the hood, arrays are actually simpler than lists. They don't have nearly as much functionality. They don't have nearly as much flexibility as lists. They're not really even their own data type. They're really just a collection of other data. Now, that may seem like a strange thing to say. Now, remember, in a list, a list is a thing, is a concept, right? A list is a list, and then you put things on the list, where an array is literally just the collection of that. It's really just a, 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 a bunch of room, a bunch of space that contains a bunch of those items, as opposed to a list, which is a thing that will wrap around other things, right? That may sound like a very subtle point uh, for those of you who are a little bit more advanced in computer science. Hopefully that makes a little bit more sense. But, you know, think of it as normally a data structure can be, you know, something that is a lot more complex. It has, you know, it has other methods. It has other structure and functionality built around it in order to allow you to do things like manipulate the things on the list. Right. So that's why the list is more complex. An array is really just space. It's just space that we know contains, you know, item after item after item. There's a little bit more to it than that, but that's really kind of where they come from, right? So it's not actually its own data type. It's really just a collection of any data type. So here, you say to have a string array, you just, this is a little bit of a different type of declaration for it. So we just use the square brackets straight away to say string and name it string array game object, game object array. So it's going to look the same. It's going to be referenced quite similarly as well, right? Because it's going to use these square brackets to access the elements, right? Now here's where some of the downside of lists, uh, excuse me, the downside of arrays start to come through because arrays are really set up, like I said, they're really just a chunk of memory. They're just a chunk of memory somewhere where you just put, you know, item after item after item. And in, in, because of that, because they are just a a kind of a location with some some things set aside normally when you create them they have a fixed length they have a fixed size they occupy some space right so you say all right in for example if i wanted to have an array of four strings this would give me set aside the space for those four strings okay uh, or i could say well new string, it would say, oh, well, I'm going to set it to four because you gave me four things to initialize into there, right? So that will allocate enough space to put four strings, and in this case, you know, create the four strings and, and put them in that space. So either of those arrays will only ever have a length of four. It is not easy and it effectively really can't do things like add things into the middle of arrays. Okay, the only way to do it is basically be sort of like tearing down the whole array and building a new one and copying everything back and forth, which is not great, right? Lists are far more flexible in that, right? They're really independent uh, entities inside of the list that can be much more easily manipulated, even though they're grouped together, right? So to access array elements, it's also very, very similar. String array one equals Bob, right? So it's really just using that square brackets again. And printing it out looks awful similar as well. So we'll jump over to my example here and say I wanted to type, um, I'm going to use my favorite now console, right line string list. But instead of string list, I'm going to say str array. All right. And I keep wanting to press save, but you'll see it prints first again. Right, because we copied our string to an array, and now we are referencing the zeroth element of that array. So this looks an awful lot like this. 
So programmatically, semantically, they look quite, quite similar. All right. Now, uh, instead of referencing the count, we reference the length of an array. Right. That's one of the first departures we have here. So let's, I'm being lazy here. I'm going to copy and paste. So we say string, oop, uh, well, I guess say str array first. And I could say length. Oops, uh, assuming I can get the capitalization, everything correct here. All right, and just to keep keep things sort of what I did here, whoops, I don't actually want to save that, is I'm really just concatenating these two strings together as I write them. So you'll see, just so they look a little different. All right. That's what I did down there. So you'll see this has a length of five. All right. So there is hello. Unity, hello, GSAS, D, there's our four, and our fifth was our, when we added, we inserted that one there. So there are a number of array methods, and methods are much more loosely, loosely termed here, all right? Um, we're sort of referencing here, and now we can get the index of, but only through the use of a system call, right? The class itself or the array itself doesn't really have a index of, but by using the system piece, we can kind of go through and get sizes and indexes from them here, right? Similarly, even though I know I just said, okay, yeah, this is uh, resizing a string, changing this, excuse me, resizing an array. I said, okay, we don't want to do that. We, we're not really doing that. And it is, it is misleading, right? This really creates a new array and replaces the reference to the old one, right? So you're literally like tearing up one array and replacing it with another, which is potentially can take a lot of time. Right? It's not something you necessarily want to do in the middle of something fast-paced action going on, and all of a sudden you say, okay, uh, I have this list of a thousand items in the scene, and what I want to do is uh, add one more. So it could, what it has to do is tear down that thousand element list and create a new thousand and one element list, which is not great, which is potentially really bad for performance. Okay, so let me just... Uh, How's the pace? <laughs> Sometimes I'm doing this just to make sure I haven't frozen either. That's also kind of like the, the worst case scenario where I've been talking for the past five minutes and somehow Discord or Twitch or something <laughs> has crashed as well. That would be terrible. So every so often we'll just keep this. Uh, oh. All right. Now, again, arrays can be converted to lists. So we can convert them back and forth if we want. All right. Uh, and now the, I, I put off before saying like, well, wh why would you want to do that? Why would you convert back and forth from lists and arrays? Now, Unity, uh, a lot of its functions, when you do things like give me, you ask it to, to give you all of the components of this type or all of the objects with this tag or something like that. You want to add, you want to look at, uh, you know, a, a bunch of components on a particular data, uh, a particular game object. And normally, the Unity functions for doing that are going to return arrays. Okay, that's just the normal way it likes to do things. If after that, you decide, okay, you want to operate on them, you want to work on them, and so on, you may very well need to convert them to lists because you're going to want to manipulate them and, and do different things. And, and consequentially, or, or sub yeah, uh, the vice versa. If you had a, thing, a bunch of things, game objects, for example, that were in a list and you wanted to pass it into one of those functions, you may very well need to convert them to an array, right? So those are the situations, probably the, the only situations where you're going to be 
uh, interested in converting back and forth between lists and arrays. I've seen a lot of other uses for that inside of you know basic game programming. Somewhere else in the world, I'm sure there's probably some really good reason to do that, but for our purposes, we're good to go. Now, okay. One interesting thing, though, that arrays do offer by default, or by kind of uh, de facto, that make them sort of at the at the surface level, or at least seem to be potentially more interesting uh, in some ways than lists, is that arrays can have more than one dimension, right? What does that mean? Well, OK, so far we've had a thing where we said, OK, there was 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, you know, and we, we referenced those, uh, the array elements by the element number. Um, and now, in the case of multi-dimensional arrays, chances are you've probably heard of matrices. The Matrix. We've all heard of The Matrix. Great movie. Um, matrices, where you have rows and columns. Okay, so you have kind of collections within collections, sort of, right? A matrix contains rows, and you can look at all of the elements of a row, or potentially you can also reference all the elements of a column. Right? So they're two-dimensional. If you think about your screen, the pixels on your screen, they are a two-dimensional or a multi-dimensional array. Right? You have rows of pixels going left to right and columns of pixels going up and down. And a particular individual pixel actually belongs to a row and a column. Right? So a pixel at the upper right or upper left corner of the screen, for example, it's... it's uh, location may be 0, 0, meaning it is at that location within this multi-dimensional array or this matrix of pixels. Right? So makes it interesting that way, that we can use it in these kind of cases. Now, if you look in the, at the slide, you'll see, ah, OK, here's a multi-dimensional array here with our elements A, B, C, and D in them. And we have a, it's a, basically, created, we've created this uh, array of strings, and we have said it is a 4x4 four four array, or a matrix, a 4x4 four four matrix, 4x4 four four array. So at 0, 0, that is the 0th row, 0th column, we put the letter A, and so that put A right there. B is at 0, 3, the 0th row the third column, 0, 1, 2, 3, right? So we reference first row and then column. C is the first row, second column. So, all right, this is, no, that's right, yep. First row, 0, 1, 2, second column. It's kind of 0th, first, second, right? Think of it that way a little bit. You have to pay attention to those. Everything is referenced off of zero. Uh, <clears throat> so C is there. And D finally is at zero, one, two, three. And this is, is this correct? Normally I get a bunch of people immediately, no, it's not correct. There's a bug. This is, uh, this is incorrect. What's incorrect about it? Well, this is the zeroth column. So D should actually be there, 0, 1. So this is actually at 3, comma, 0. This would be 3, comma, 1 right here. Right? So this is a 4 by 4. Then. There's also this concept, and I haven't seen this used a lot. We'd like to mention it so that people are aware of it. Um, but I prefer for people to be careful. Jagged lists and arrays where you potentially have sort of empty or uh, uneven rows where you have, say, a, an array that has, well, we know it has a certain number of rows, but we don't necessarily know how many columns it has in there, right? So it gets a little bit tricky in, in that way. So you can do things like say, ah, okay, this array, 
this two-dimensional array, we know that it has three rows, but we don't know how many columns it has. And C Sharp will allow you to do that. And then you can assign each row directly. So, for example, in this case, the zeroth row will have four columns, and you can then assign things. The first row will have three columns. The second row will have two columns. And you can see it visualized here. Right, there's our four, our three, our two. Right. So once you start creating these sort of jagged lists and jagged arrays, what you're really kind of doing is you're, you're breaking arrays and lists a little bit into situations where sort of the rows and columns sort of become, they start to become independent and they, get a, they can be slightly unwieldy, you know, be careful about using them, but it is, it is uh, potentially, uh, potentially a useful thing. Right. Now, mentioned this cool thing about multi-dimensional arrays where you could have kind of, uh, you know, two-dimensional things. Now, what strings also have, or excuse me, what lists also have that is cool on their part is that you can have lists of lists, right? So that is kind of, I think that can potentially make up for this uh, multi-dimensional uh, array uh, advantage there, but it gets a little bit interesting, we'll just say. Be careful. Managing lists of lists and lists of lists of lists and so on and so on can certainly get hairy, uh, but it is possible, right? The flexibility, you know, we're, we're I always like to say, when everyone's, you know, can you do that? And asking about a software project. Of course I can. It's software. I can do anything. I can, you know, just anything is possible with software. Lists of lists of lists of lists is possible in software. Why not? So, um, so that covers the two basics. So when should you use one or the other? Well, like I said, each have pros and cons. Lists have flexible length, whereas array length is more difficult to change and certainly can be uh, far less performant, and far, far, far less efficient to change the length of array. Arrays can be slightly faster especially when you're referencing a particular element, because usually the math for figuring out where a particular element is in, a, in an array is simpler than the math that has to happen to figure out where in a list something is. So arrays can be slightly faster, depending on, on what you're using them for. So if you have something that's fixed in size and you know you're going to need to reference it all around, like imagine It'd be very inefficient if your screen was a list of pixels instead of just an array of pixels, right? It's fixed size. You know where things are. It has nice, clean geometry. So it makes sense to reference that sort of structure through an array. Whereas lists, you know, if you have something that's dynamically changing in size and so on, then it makes sense, right? So arrays do have that multidimensionality kind of built in. And they also do allow, and they will automatically have empty elements in the middle of the collection. So like, you know, if you, un, if you don't initialize the pixels in the middle of the screen, they still exist and they can still be there. So they are potentially useful for that kind of, you know, fixed use. They can certainly be great. But they do, uh, they do require a little bit more planning ahead. In the case of arrays, you have to, you know, make sure you size them, you create them, you know, everything about them is, is done ahead of time. Because the nice thing about lists is they take less forethought. They are more flexible. They have flexible length. You can manipulate them in different ways. And uh, for that purpose, we do generally lists are, are more attractive when you're prototyping, especially because prototyping does require a lot of flexibility and, you know, lots of different uses. So we'll see mostly lists used probably in the projects that you're going to undertake. Um, I'm going to recommend, or I, what I like to see in the projects, is that uh, uh, you demonstrate both use of both of those so we understand that, you know, that, or I know, I can see that you understand both the use of arrays and the use of lists. And we'll talk about, you know, in some of the prototype games we're going to build, where to go ahead and use each of them. All right, let me take a look what time it is. Oh, about an hour. All right, so we'll finish up the lecture piece of things. Uh, and then uh, I'll 
either stop and then start another lecture just for those people who, who want a bit of a break or want to at least break up watching an hour long video. So are there other collection types? Yes, absolutely. Uh, there are dictionaries. Some people love dictionaries. The nice thing about dictionaries and other languages, you know, the dictionary data structure is you can look up things by key more directly. So you kind of create this key and value. So if you want to look up, you know, um, the, you know, you can say, ah, give me some, something can just be called blue or, you know, whatever. And then you say blue and give me the value that belongs to blue as opposed to referencing it by element 12, you know, sort of thing. You can sort of create these named pairs. And that's pretty cool. Um, they aren't as neatly integrated with a lot of this stuff in Unity. Uh, they can potentially be um, a little even less performance than, than lists, but they are potentially cool. So uh, in some advanced projects where you are doing things where perhaps the user enters data, where the user um, you know, may have certain responses that are made or you, you know, kind of need something to be a little more flexible in sort of a natural language-ish sort of way, then it might, sen might make sense to use uh, uh, something like dictionaries instead of arrays or lists. So, and they're not quite as wonderfully integrated with Unity either. So that's the summary. Summarizing. Collections can be used any number of objects uh, of a certain type. Lists is generally more useful uh, more flexible for now. Uh, arrays are less, 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 yeah, arrays are less flexible, but they do have their place. And so because of that, we're generally going to use lists when we can, but some functions use arrays, so we're going to need to know about them, need, need to know how to use them. All right. So um, the next piece here, uh, I'm going to really just, in this part of the lecture, I'm going to just kind of touch on them real briefly. So just to kind of cover it because they're all covered in the same lecture notes. And then I'll have a separate lecture. Where we're going to really kind of demonstrate this in Unity. Uh, use sprites, for example, sprites and then specifically prefabs. So we're going to introduce them conceptually for now. You have likely seen sprites a little bit. Uh, in our sample game, we used uh, sort of a, a sprite placeholder. Uh, and here in our intro project, these were sprites that we created in the game. And they're very simple sprites. They're basically just, you know, a player object that has a sprite renderer on them, right? And the sprite renderer knows about an actual sprite graphic, which is usually just some sort of PNG or JPEG or is it GIF or GIF? I don't know. Let's uh, get everyone upset about uh, GIFs. GIFs. Yeah, okay. Anyway, um, so the idea is basically that you do have, you know, some sort of object that has a sprite render on that. Now, sprites are basically, they are arrays. They are two-dimensional. Like we were talking about graphics a minute ago, right? You can think of a sprite as being a rectangular or raster sort of graphic. It has rows and columns. It has pixels within it. Right? It's not a three-dimensional thing, really. It's really just for containing a simple, usually it is, think of it as a bitmap. Okay. So that's what sprites generally are in our world here. All right. Sprites are 2D game images, usually with transparency. Right? So they have red, green, and blue within them to establish what color they are. And then they also have this notion of no color or no or some degree of transparency. Right? Our RPI seal, for example, it has these uh, edges around here where there's no color, where you can see through it. So it has zero, it has full transparency there, or zero alpha. Transparency, also known as alpha. So you add them the same way to your project, the same way you add most assets, including sound assets, you sort of just drag them in. If you drag an image into the scene, normally you just then it will create a game object for you and put a sprite render on that and reference the graphic that you dragged in. Um, there are some import settings, which we'll show import settings. Make sure texture type is set to sprite 2D and UI. Uh, there's lots and lots and lots of places to get sprites from. You can certainly just go to the internet and start looking for 
graphics or images of any sort, and they can be sprites, right? Drag in any JPEG image, like I said, drag them in. Or there are lots of sprites that are specifically made for interactive and gaming use. You can go to things like the Unity Asset Store. There's opengameart.org, itch.io, Game Dev Marketplace, Reddit, Game Assets, Game Art 2D, and so on. You can also create your own. Uh, don't require that you create your own in this particular course, but you certainly can. If you have something like Krita, or you have uh, Photoshop, or you have uh, Illustrator, Inkscape, whatever your application is, you can create your own uh, sprites there as well. And the where it gets, starts to get really interesting is when sprites, this is why we can include sprites with collections, because sometimes sprites aren't just a sort of single image. We use a sprite sheet or a sprite atlas to hold multiple sprites. And maybe that's frames of animation, or maybe it's parts of an environment, or maybe it's tile maps or something where we have a collection of images that are bound together just by, by virtue of the fact that they are inside the same image, right? So if I come to Unity and uh, let's see, let's introduce the Asset Store. Let's do that real quick. Window and hopefully in here, General, where did it go? I haven't looked in the Unity. There we go, Asset Store, not in General. Unity Asset Store, Window Asset Store. If you haven't seen it yet, welcome to the Asset Store. It can be one of your best friends. Um, there are a bunch of really, really great assets that you can download, and uh, I recommend some specific ones if you want, um, certainly for prototyping. If we do things like, ah, oh, let's look for all 2D assets. So the Unity Asset Store is really great for finding things like you say, ah, show me all 2D assets and show me all of the free assets. So it has this kind of search field to say, you know, let's start 2D free. Great. And it will show you all of the things you can then download. And you can see I've already downloaded a couple of these ones, uh, some ones I like, Bayat Games, B-A-Y-A-T Games, or Ansimas, they're two of my favorites. Ansimas' Sunnyland, and he has Sunnyland Forest, and a bunch of really, really great um, games in there. Uh, Bandits, I've seen people use these. Uh, lots and lots of great ones. Let's, let's, grab this, let's grab this one. I have, I've never used this one before, but I've seen other people use it, so we'll give that a try. So click on that. I'll say, ah, okay, you know, here are some free pixel art 2D. All right, great, download. And all right, I have now purchased the item. I can say import, and it will ask me which things from that do I want to put into my game. And let's see what we have here. We have sprites, we have animations, we have all sorts of things. And what I'm gonna do for now is I'm actually going to only import the sprites from this. All right, we'll talk about animations later, but for now, only the sprites. And I will say import, and you will see that I have this new folder called Bandit's Pixel Art. And within Bandit's Pixel Art, I now have some sprite sheets. I click on one of these. Uh, oh, do mm, I didn't want to do anything. Why well, do you open this file? Uh, cancel. There we go. Uh, <laughs> so let's see. Now these have already been carved up potentially into individual images, right? Which is mighty nice of them. And how did that work? Well, if I click on one of these files, you'll see up here is my import settings. So if I try to drag this file, now I'm gonna go back to my game, go back to scene. If I try to just drag this in there, um, it wants to create an animation. So you have to be careful about this <laughs> because now what it's saying is, ah, okay, I've recognized that that file contains multiple sprites. It didn't just put a sprite into the, into the scene. It tried to create an animation. 
It did that because it saw that this sheet was a multiple sprite sheet. Right. So this is kind of a, a special case. Right. This sheet has lots of sprites on it. Now if I grabbed just one and dragged it in, I could do that. And it just created a simple sprite renderer. But you saw as I tried to create that whole sheet, or if I tried to even grab a collection of them and drag them into the scene, it would say, ah, do you want to create an animation? So we're not going to do that just yet. But we just want to talk about this notion of sprites. So this is why I mentioned in the, in the uh, lecture notes, we wanted to have texture types, sprite, 2D, and UI. And sometimes, if we have a sheet of sprites, it's going to be a multiple sprite as opposed to single. Now, if I said single here, let's see, this is going to be weird. I drag that in. Uh, it still didn't like all that. Uh, I think I'd have to say apply. Yeah, let me do that. <laughs> and this breaks breaks my sprites in here. You'll see now what's happened is I've created this object which has my whole sprite sheet on it because I said, ah, okay, this is just a single sprite. So it's put the whole image here, everything in there, rather than dividing it up into multiples. If I go back and change that, you'll see now it's, ah, okay, it's redefined everything. And we'll look at that in more detail later as well. So that's the concept here of uh, sprites. All right. So 2D game images, those are our sprites. Simple ones will contain one image, one file, one image. You just drag them in, and away you go. More complex ones are going to contain potentially sprite sheets or even animations. And in those cases, they're going to contain, you're going to have to define them, you're going to have to set them to be multiple and then you can get into like the sprite editor and carving things up and so on. We'll cover that in a lot more detail later. So the other type of potential collection I want to conceptually introduce you to is this thing called a unity prefab. Okay. A prefab is more like a template or a um, sort of a it's sort of like a class. It's sort of a class with predefined it's a it's basically a game object that has predefined components, a predefined set of components on them. And this is going to be uh, one of your best friends uh, in Unity, prefabs. Okay. Um, once something is sort of a prefab, then you can create instances of that prefab in your game. So it's sort of like a structure, sort of like a template, sort of like this you know, sort of thing. Uh, it's very, 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 very useful. And to show how sort of simple they are to sort of create. So I've created this light bandit here. I you know, just dragged something into the scene. And even well, I have my player, for example, here. So my player. And say I wanted to create that as a template, so because I want to reuse that somewhere else in the game. So what do I do? How do I create that? Well, I'm going to, and this step is even sort of optional. I can say create folder. And I will create a prefab folder. I like to keep things in folders here. Right? If I grab that object, and my player again, and I grab the player and I drag it and put it into that folder, you'll see now that this is the player.prefab that has been created. Okay. So I have a version of that that I can use sort of as a stamp. I can just like put into a scene wherever I want. Okay, so I can even come into this scene. You'll see it's, it is suddenly my uh, character. My I don't know if I can zoom in. No, I guess I can't. Um, my little icon for my player over here has gone from a normal gray cube to this blue cube because it is now sort of referencing a prefab there. Right. So I can decide if I wanted to. I could delete that delete my player. Oh no, I don't have a player anymore, but I can just drag it from here and put that in there. And it has everything that was associated with it. I can even do things like grab and put a second player and a third player, right? Now here, it doesn't make too much sense to have multiple players, does it? It's not a multiplayer game, and the interface certainly doesn't agree with it, and it's going to break lots of things, but that's the idea behind the prefab 
really just to, to illustrate that and say, okay, we have a player prefab. All right. And we'll go back to kind of finish up here a little bit. There's only a couple, couple of slides for prefabs. So prefabs allow us to intuitively create these sort of duplicates uh, of, uh, or stamps of objects that have been created, right? An asset allows us to store all of the things, all the properties, all the components that are part of that object as a template that allows you to create then new instances of the same object in that scene, right? So it's sort of, it's a collection of things on there and can be used in collections. It's not really a collection in and of itself. It's sort of, well, there's there's ways to use them as collections. They are, we'll get into them. They, they could be a whole, there'll be a whole uh, another lecture in and of themselves, right? So if you want to try though, you can certainly follow along here. You can, you know, make a prefab, create a game object, put some components on there and so on. And all you have to do to turn that into a template, to turn that into a prefab is to drag it into your prefab directory, hopefully you create a prefab directory for that. Right. You can then modify it, you can modify the particular one you dragged into the scene, or you can even modify the prefab so that all prefabs also get modified. Right. And where it gets particularly interesting is you can also create or instantiate prefabs as you need them inside your program through the use of this instantiation um, function here. So instantiation allows you to create something from a prototype at a certain position in your game. So we reference what prefab, what item we want to create, where we want to put it, and then potentially also how we want it rotated, right? because it assumes that, yeah, you're not going to want to put all these things at the same location. You're at least going to want them to have their own locations, right? So this is going to be one of the key things to your, uh, your game. And it's cool because you can use prefabs for sort of these scripted, this idea of scripted building. Once you have a brick, you can build a wall out of bricks. Or you have a castle that's built of turrets, and each turret is a is a prefab, you can build it from multiple ones. Or in your game where you have apples dropping from a tree or baskets that are catching apples or enemies that are zombies, right? Each one of those things can be a prefab that your game can then decide where should they be located, how many of them should there be. You can kind of construct the world, build the world from prefabs. Okay, so we'll have a real kind of line by line definition or uh, description of all those. All right, so that was, we're up to 2.48, and um, I'm in need of a, of a breath, and I'm sure you all are as well. Uh, any questions? I haven't seen, heard a lot of people shouting out, so hopefully um, these concepts are going to at least stick with you a little bit. Uh, you may still be, I've seen some of the projects uh, look fairly completed, others not quite there yet. So um, what I'm going to ask is that we use the, if there are no specific questions about this material, uh, we can use the next chunk of class time specifically as office hours to kind of get through the um, project one, get it out of the way, get last things answered. Anybody have any uh, questions? I'll pause for a moment. I don't see anybody typing, so I'll assume that's a no. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off the stream here and reach out to the people who have reached out to me, use that time, and also if you have any questions that you didn't want to kind of ask specifically or you wanted more detail um, or they're specific to your thinking on your project, let me know. All right. Um, and then supplemental materials for this, I'm going to do a separate uh, video uh, on some of the sprite stuff and building sprite sheets and so on, working with sprites, and then one more specifically on prefabs as well. And the we will have another similar lecture on Thursday, and uh, we'll see. Hopefully we can strike a balance of... Uh, extra materials and in-class materials and so on. Um, 
has everyone in general I'm going to put one last thing to re react to have you been able to has or, or well yeah Has everyone, are, are you basically sort of caught up on videos? Is the, the, the pace that I'm churning them out uh, okay? Um, I know it's it's kind of tricky um, making sure. All right, so generally okay. All right, I'll uh, pause for a breath then and uh, reach out to the people who need some specific help. All right talk to everyone later on or at least I'll see you on Thursday thank you all for who have attended and if you do interact with other people in any other classes who have been attending you don't see their names in the list uh, give them a hard time I like to hear about what's going on if I don't hear from you though uh, we will not have another meeting specifically before the project is due so keep an eye out for uh, a submission point on LMS to say okay yes I'm done with the project if you had any specific questions or comments and so on on there um, do that. Uh, do take some time to comment your code, right? So I should be able to know in any particular code if I just even have, you know, nothing but a script. I hope to find your name in there so I know who wrote that script, right? I like to be able to identify things. This is especially important in this sort of new online world, right? I'm. <laughs> I want to stress. I want to do as much interacting with you all as possible, uh, despite the way we're set up. One thing that I might be doing in the future as well, probably starting now as we're getting into the second project, is setting up individual meeting times with people. Uh, we might use one class a week sort of as individual meeting times, basically to say, okay, do a 10-minute check-in one-on-one either every week or every other week, something like that. So uh, I'm thinking of that. If you think that would be useful or you have you know, a particular time that works for you, let me know, and we'll kind of get into that as well so we can kind of see where things are at. But you know, try to make this as personalized as we possibly can uh, to substitute for our lack of physical proximity. <laughs> All right. Take care, everybody.